I just got finished doing all of the Algebra 1 Common Core tests for all the kids. And then I went back and just wanted to do a little bit of quality control because I realized I was having a problem with my audio. <laughs> and I was having a lot more than I thought. So I have to go back and redo a bunch of these videos. So this is one of the first ones we're going to redo. This was the Algebra 1 Common Core June 2014, the first one ever. Now, all of this material can be found very simply on my website. You'll notice it's mrkrausmath.com. It's right there. It's very easy to find, mrkrausmath.com, all one word. You go to Regions Review, and you click on Common Core, and you'll see that I've got a copy of the exam. Just click on that. It'll take you the copy of the exam. I give you a copy of the multiple choice answer. I think that's kind of important because... You know, I hope your teacher doesn't just let you turn in multiple choice answers. You actually have to show work because work's very important. And then I take you through the videos. Here are all the videos. I got them all done. They're all done. Every one of them's done. They're up, but some of them aren't very good. So uh, we're going to redo this first one. So let's get rid of this and let's get started. Uh, this video will be for part one, problems one through 12. And just in case you're wondering, my name is Mr. Kraus, but I go by Mr. Key today. All right, here we go. Uh, that's not the page I want. Page two, page one, actually. All right. When solving this equation, Emily wrote this first. So you got to kind of figure out, let's see, if I look at this and I look at this, what's different? Well, I noticed this 16 is different, and the 7, and this 9 is missing. So what they did was they brought the 9 over. They added 9 to this side and added 9 to this side. Well, let's see. What property allows me to do that by adding? All right, is it the addition property of, equi uh, of equality? Well, we're adding and we're keeping the equation. Commutative property, just as a reminder for addition, means that if I take A plus B, it's really equal to B plus B. A. I changed the order. We didn't change any order. All we did was move the 9. Multiplication. We didn't even multiply anything. I didn't even look at that. The distributive property, the parentheses are still there. So clearly, choice 1 is the big winner. All right, moving on, moving on, moving on. Okay. Officials in a town use the function C. Seriously? This is common core. Well, we're going to use the function called C to do the traffic patterns of cars. Oh, okay, so what, all right, it kind of makes sense now, but it's still kind of silly. So anyway, we're gonna use the function C of N, where C represents, I have no idea what C represents, Pfft, whatever. N is the number of observed vehicles. So N is the number of observed vehicles. What would be appropriate domain? Okay, so, Normally you see f of x and you're like, okay, x is the domain. But you need to remember whatever's in here is the domain. The c of whatever, that's the range. So we're really talking about n in our numbers. So if you're counting cars, would you start with like negative 2? I don't think so. Negative cars don't make any sense. A half a car, okay. There are some cars that probably constitute being a half a car, but in reality, there are no half a cars. Uh, if you were going to count, as soon as you got there, you'd be like, oh, geez, I've got zero cars now, and then I've got one car, two car, three cars. This is the big, big winner right there, the natural numbers. By the way, I'm going to finish four problems, and I'm going to pause it because I'm having such problems with my audio. I have a crappy computer. I apologize. I'm not apologizing. I'm just kidding. So what I want to do is I want to do A minus B. Well, A is 3x squared plus 5x minus 6 minus. Now, the reason this is a tricky question is because we're subtracting this whole B thing off. And I'll bet some of you can imagine. See, one of the tricks to doing well on the Regents exam is being able to figure out what are the mistakes what are the common mistakes kids make? And a common mistake made here, I hope you know the answer. I hope in your head you're going, oh yeah, I know what that is. A common mistake here is not distributing this negative. Another common mistake made is distributing it but not doing it pr properly. This is just 3x squared plus 5x minus 6. 
Now, negative times negative is positive 2x squared. A negative times negative 6 is positive 6x. And then a negative times positive 7 is negative 7. So you got to be careful. Distributing a negative, really, the only thing it does is changes the sign of everything. So now i got to combine like terms. 5x squared. How many have 5x squared? I bet all of them do. Oh, these two don't. And then uh, plus 11x. I bet we're done now. Yep, there it is. The big winner. Okay, we're going to do this next problem, then I'm taking a pause. So ding, 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 ding. All right, so the question says is, which one of these graphs is represented here? I'm going to start with this one. Wait a second. One of them has to be a dotted line or a dashed line, and one of them has to be solid. So these two are automatically out because they have two solid lines. So now I'm going to see if I can just go with this one right here. I need a y-intercept of negative 2 and a positive slope of 3. y-intercept of negative 2 and a positive slope of 3. Up 3 over 1. Up 3 over 1. Yep. Up 3 over 1. Up 3 over 1. So both those lines work. However, this symbol is less than. And the only one that's really less than that's here is this one. This one's the one that's shading down. Less than shades down. So this is the big winner. But let's just check that other equation. That other equation was y plus x is greater than 2. So let's try that. y plus x is greater than 2. Bringing the x over, I get y is greater than negative x plus 2. So here's my y-intercept of 2 coming down, and we're greater than. So, yeah, that's the right answer. All right, I'm going to take a little pause, and I'll be right back. Well, that was quick. Got my Dunkin' Donuts coffee. By the way, I'm a Dunkin' Donuts fan. They're, they're a sponsor. They're a sponsor. They're not giving me any money. The only thing they're sponsoring is keeping me awake while I do this math. and makes me excited to do math. My students say to me, Mr. Cross, by the way, I teach out in Hilton, a little outside of Rochester, New York. I teach, my kids say to me, Mr. Krause. What else do you have in that cup? And I like to tell them, sugar and cream. <laughs> All right, kids, I'm going to do this like the really hard way because I like doing things the hard way. And then I'm going to do it the really easy way, the way I would expect you to do on the test. And one of the things you're going to hear me talk about, I hope I say this enough, is that if you can do the problems two different ways, if you can do the problems two different ways, there's a really good chance of course, you have to arrive at the same answer. There's a really good chance you're going to crush this test. So first things first, let's use that distributive property to distribute. You have a calculator. Stop whining about the fact that you have to do this. Plus, now if you multiplied 7 thirds times 9 28s, by the way, the calculator I use is the TI Inspire. It's a great calculator. It's very easy to use. It's kind of intuitive. I go through it. That's all I'm going to use. I think we're going to multiply by 9 28. 9 over, I think it's 28. And we get 3 fourths. Okay. So plus 3 fourths is equal to 20. So I'll subtract 3 fourths. So 20 minus ka -ching. and I get 77 fourths. So I get 7 over 3x equals 77 over 4. Oh, my God, this is so difficult. Really? The calculator is doing all the hard work. All right, I'm going to divide by 7 thirds. By the way, I would never divide by 7 thirds. I would multiply by the reciprocal, but whatever. Divide by 7 thirds. I'll hit divide by, and then control division. 7 over 3. Enter. 33 over 4. So I get x equals 33 over 4. Huh? That's not there. Oh, okay. So go back and hit control, control, enter again. Oh, 3.53. Well, somebody screwed up. Oh, no. Well, the answer was 33 over 4. What, what, where did this come from? Here, let's go up here. Ching, 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 ching. I don't know what happened there. Hint, enter, enter, and then 
Now I just want to figure out what this is as a decimal. It's 8.25. There's my answer, 8.25. Now, how would I do this or how would I expect you to do this on a test? I don't want you to do all this. You may, you're probably going to make mistakes and then you'll be crying about the calculator. I would just stow 8.25 in for X, control var. Almost all the graphing calculators now will do this. You stow a number in for X and then just type in the left side. 7 thirds controlled vision, 7 over 3 times parentheses, I have no idea, x plus 9 28, x plus 9 divided by 28, and hopefully it turns out to be 20, there it is, done, problem's over with, bodied, some weirdo in my school says bodied, so uh, let's get this blown up a little bit, ding, 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 ding. All right, the average below shows the balance in a savings account where interest is compounded annually. We got compounded annually. No money is deposited or withdrawn after the initial deposit. So we have an initial deposit of 380, and we want to see what kind of model is this. So first of all, is it growth? Is it growing or is it decaying? Well, it should be pretty obvious that we're getting quite a bit bigger. So it's definitely not decaying or has a linear rate of change or negative linear rate of change then we have to decide does it have a consistent rate of change because if it does then that would be hey it's linear or does it have an increasing or decreasing rate of change I think I'm going to abbreviate rate of change as rock, rock, R-O-C, rock, rate of change. So if I look at this, uh, here it looks like it went up about 200, not quite. And here it went up not quite 300. And here it went up almost exactly 400. And here it went up about 600. And here it went up about... 900 or so to speak. So do I have a consistent? No, I don't have a consistent rate of change. And since I don't have a consistent rate of change and it's growing, it has to be exponential growth. Choice four, seven. A company that manufactures radio has to pay the startup cost and then it spends a certain amount of money per month. If the cost of manufacturing the radios is given by this equation, so R is the number of cost of radios, so this is my startup cost, and this is my cost per radio. So the value 525 represents, no, it doesn't represent startup cost because it's per radio, and that's 525 per radio. The profit earned from the sale of one radio. This is not a profit equation. This is a cost equation. We have nothing to do with profit in this one. This is simply what it costs, so we're not talking about this. The amount of money spent to manufacture each radio. No, 525 is not, the, well, maybe. Yeah, wait, this is the amount of money spent to manufacture each radio. I think that probably is the answer. Let me just check. The average number of radio manufacturers, no. It, wow, that's a really straight line. The answer is right here, the amount of money to manufacture one radio or each radio individually. And finally, number eight, not finally, but I'm going to take a break. Uh, oh, so obviously we are completing the square. Now I call it completing a square like that because what I'll do is, first things first, we're going to toss that over there. So I end up with x squared minus 6x plus square. Now I put the square there because it's completing the square is equal to, now if I put a, your teacher should have told you this, if you put something on the left side, you put the same thing on the right side. That's why I put two squares, one on the left, one on the right. The next step for completing the square is to take half of this. Well, half of this is negative three. Not positive three, negative three squared. Well, negative three squared is nine. And nine, by the way, gone and gone because it's negative three and then if i add these together i get 21 there's my answer choice two and that ends those four so i'll be back bye i'm back with my coffee oh yeah 
Oh, Bruder, or uh, Dunkin' Donuts. When are you going to start giving me some money? Anyway, here we go. A ball is thrown in the air, um, and it starts at a 48-foot cliff so that it eventually lands on the ground. The graph below shows the height of Y of the ball from the ground. So here it is. It's starting at 48 feet in the air. It eventually reaches a height somewhere about, let's say, that's maybe close to 150, approximately 147.5. Who knows? And then it lands back down on the ground after 5.5 seconds. Okay. For which interval was the height always decreasing? All right. Decreasing means it's going down. So here, it's at this point right here, it's neither decreasing nor increasing. It's like, oh, we're increasing, 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 stop. It almost is like a momentary stop, and then all of a sudden, we're going to start decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. So at this point, it's neither increasing nor decreasing. Ooh, I don't know why that happened. Same is true down here. It's going to keep decreasing, 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 and still it's, until it stops. So... Uh, it happens at, this looks like, 2.5 seconds. So right at 2.5 seconds, all the way to 5.5 seconds. And there is your answer. What are the roots of this? So again, it looks as if we're doing completing the square. So let me do completing the square on this. We get another opportunity for that because whoever wrote this test loves, loves, loves completing the square. Plus, I'm going to do my squares in purple. I know I'm going to put a plus square over here, too, so I might as well put it in purple here. What was I using? Blue. And I bring this 16 over. When it comes over, it becomes positive 16. So, ka-ching, ka-ching. So, remember, half of this, half of positive 4 is positive 2. Don't go start thinking you're going to go circle answers now. 2 squared is 4. So, we're going to add 4 to both sides, 4 and 4. So, I get 20. So, now, the next step would be to take the square root of both sides. And you have to remember, when you take the square root, you have to put a plus or minus. So it looks like we've got x plus 2 equals plus or minus the square root of 20. Now the 2 comes over, so you get x equals negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 20. So now it's down to a 50-50 desk because these two have to go away because they're positive 2, not negative 2. So what's the difference? The difference is somebody simplified this radical 20, and I hope you're good at simplifying. So we have to simplify the radical 20, and it's either going to be this or it's going to be this. So this is equal to the square root of 4 times 5. Well, what is the square root of 4? It's 2. So this is 2 square roots of 5. ka -ching. There's the big answer. There's the big winner. Oh, moving on to the next page. Are we almost done? Ooh, 11. I got two left. This is an easy problem. Anytime you get these correlation coefficients, it's an easy problem. So the question says, what is the correlation coefficient of the linear fit of the data shown below to the nearest hundredth. Well, they're not expecting you to actually do this math. You probably could. But if I'm graphing this, first and foremost, this has a negative rate of change or slope. I should have said rock rate of change. So therefore, it, has a, uh, it should have a negative correlation coefficient. So we're only looking for a negative. So you guys are gone. Now, if it's 1, if it's 1, this is perfect. Perfect. All points on the line. Well, that's not perfect. I got I don't even have a single point really on this line. So this would be the best answer. It would in order for it to be 1, every single point would have to be like right touching that line and that's not what's going on here. All right. Number 12, you notice I did all the problems already after this because that next video wasn't fine. Keith determines the zeros of a function to be negative 6 and 5. What could be Keith's function? This is distracting me. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to work backwards. Actually, what I would just do is investigate this and look at it, but we're going to look backwards, and we're going to say, okay, 
ching, 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 ching. We gotta find those two parentheses. Well, I know my roots or my zeros are x equals negative six and x equals positive five. Well, if I'm working backwards, then these should have come from a parentheses that said x plus six and x minus five. And it's as simple as that. That's the answer to the question. Uh, which one has an x plus six and an x minus five? It looks as if this one does. No other one does, right? X plus six, x minus five. There it is. That's the big winner. And I am out of here. It's done. Bye.